So tonight I'm just going to talk a little bit on the church. That's what the three chapters are about um, coming up in the next uh, unit. And uh, so Jesus, part of the purpose in choosing apostles, the main purpose in choosing the 12 apostles was to teach them what he wanted to, them to continue to do. That being uh, preach, reconcile people to God, and bring healing to people's lives. So we teach the church through... Uh, Actually, a lot of online stuff now, and uh, preaching, teaching the kids, adult education, healing comes through uh, sacrament of reconciliation, and also the sacrament of the sick, or last rites, or anointing. They all have the same type of prayers. The last rites prayers are slightly different. And then Jesus, after choosing the twelve, he gave them the grace to be able to fulfill the duties he would like them to do. And he did that at Pentecost, where the apostles and the Blessed Virgin Mary received the gift of the Holy Spirit 50 days after Jesus died. Uh, Jesus was with the apostles for 40 days, then he ascended to heaven. And 10 days later is Pentecost. So after Pentecost, they immediately began their ministry, preaching about Jesus, preaching what Jesus taught them, and bring people to God by teaching about the good news of Jesus. And when you look at uh, Peter's first talk after he received the gift of the Holy Spirit at, at Pentecost, he was Pentecost was a feast in Jerusalem originally to celebrate the Ten Commandments being given to Moses. So there's Jewish people from all over the place. Peter talked. People were from other nations, different languages. They all heard him in their own language, and he told them that you killed. Jesus, they say, what can we do about that? He said, be baptized for forgiveness of sin. And he said much more than that, but that's a summary. And 3,000 people were baptized. So you think about the apostles just going to these random towns and teaching about Jesus. If they think it was about them, that people started believing Jesus because of them, that'd be crazy because... Uh, for people to believe in their message takes more than just me talking. It takes the gift of the Holy Spirit activating their souls and hearts to believe. It's a grace from God to believe. And uh, so it's kind of both uh, um, hearing the message, accepting the message, and uh, having faith in Christ. So you have holy orders being established by the apostles. So they, the apostles need their teaching about Christ to continue and holy orders is how is what how they continue their uh, teaching the church how the church continues so the apostles ordained bishops priests and deacons to continue the ministry one thing I like about the job duties is bishops priests and deacons our job is just to be a steward a steward is somebody who takes care of the master's stuff so what we do is uh, take care of the teachings of Christ. We, aren't, we don't have the authority to change them, and we pass them on through teaching and preaching. So that might different situations might arise, maybe technology changes or something like that, and then we need to apply scripture and Catholic tradition to those new things that can happen at times as well. So the four marks of the church. The church is one holy Catholic and apostolic so the church being one means the holy spirit unites all of us through our baptism we're all sons and daughters of god on a spiritual level we're all related through the holy spirit the holy spirit is the soul of the church i've always liked that statement the church so that's the church being one the church is holy the word holy means set apart so being baptized believers be, we're set apart to serve God in the world. The church is Catholic. The word Catholic means universal. So the church is there for people of all races, all tongues, all nations. So like the church in Africa right now, it's growing hugely for a lot of years, uh, which is kind of uh, interesting just as an example. The church being apostolic, it's founded by the apostles, founded on the teachings of Christ and preaching the good news. So the, the church today teaches what Jesus taught 
the apostles. The church's mission is to announce the good news of Christ. So the, the word gospel means good news. So we all have a vocation within the church. We are, our common vocation is a vo vocation to holiness or a universal call to holiness. And the church looks at vocation as God's plan for our lives. So there's four vocations. We have uh, the married life, the single life, religious brothers and sisters, religious orders, and then the uh, ordained. So just go over the structure of the church a little bit, starting with the ordained. Uh, Jesus chose St. Peter to be the leader of the apostles. And so that position is now called the Pope. The Pope is a successor to St. Peter. The Pope is also the Bishop of Rome because that's where Peter died. That's where he did uh, ministry towards the end of, life, end of his life. The uh, Holy Spirit guides the Pope and helps him lead the church and care for people. So. I don't know if you know this, but every three years, each bishop goes meets with the Pope. There's 5,600 bishops in the world, all over the world, every country. So the Pope hears from all over the world what's going on every three years from each of these guys. So he's doing these meetings all year. I was just thinking, it's like, you would have to have a lot of grace to be able to hear all that stuff. You know, some of it's gonna be really good, but you're gonna also be hearing about things that really doesn't make your soul feel good. So I, I really gotta believe, you know, we pray for the Pope at every mass, and I think uh, he definitely needs those prayers. So it's like, I guess pre, uh, what do you call that? Pre-NSA, the Pope is probably the most informed person in the world as far as what's going on. Um, so I don't know. I, th I always thought, I, th I thought about that often on the last few years for some reason. So the, the apostles' teaching authority has been handed on to the bishops. The bishops are successors to the apostles. So they have the authority um, to teach and govern in their, in their own diocese. So most bishops have a diocese. Our diocese, the lacrosse diocese, is 13,000 square miles. It goes from Prairie to Sheen, up a little bit north of Eau Claire, down Highway 29, over to Wausau, and then a big triangle back down to Prairie to Sheen. It's mostly by county, like Portage, Portage County is in our um, diocese. There's 19 counties, so it's a pretty big area. So the bishop needs help. So you have uh, ordained priests, we uh, assist the bishop as pastors of parishes in his uh, diocese. So priest celebrates uh, the sacrament, helps teach, and does whatever needs to be done within the church. And then we also have permanent deacons, and those guys are usually married, and they can celebrate baptisms, marriages, and they also are to help out with charitable works. That's kind of what they, what. It talks about deacons doing in the Acts of the Apostles right after the Gospel of John. So then church members are to help with our uh, church ministries and also help lead the church. Like we got a parish council, finance council, we got tons of people that help out with different things at church and I definitely need help and appreciate it. Then besides helping the church, you know, we're to pass on our faith in whatever uh, way we're able to, uh, maybe just through living out our faith, teaching the faith within our families, and living it. So getting into living it, uh, we have five precepts of the church. So that's kind of like the minimum expected um, for uh, church members. And it's also things that are going to help deepen our relationship with God on the positive side of things. So the, fi the five Precepts of the church are to take part in Mass on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation. So right now, we have dispensation from attending uh, the Sunday Obligation on, or Saturday Night Mass. We all know why. <laughs> so uh, the Holy Days of Obligation. So that just means uh, we're expected to attend Mass on those days. So one is January 1st. That's Mary, the Feast of Mary, Mother of God. November 1st, All Saints Day. December 8th, the Immaculate Conception of Mary, the fact that she's born free from original sin. And then lastly, 
Christmas. Number two, so the first one of uh, being attending Mass Sundays, Holy Days obligation. So number two, celebrate the sacrament of reconciliation once a year. Three, receive Holy Communion at least once a year, minimum during Easter season. Four, observe days of fasting and abstinence. So we definitely know those on uh, Fridays of Lent where we abstain from eating meat. And then on uh, Ash Wednesday and Good Friday, uh, those are days of abstinence and fasting, which meaning no meat. And then you can, for fasting, eat one meal and two other small meals that don't equal that meal, just as a, uh, giving up something for Christ. Christ died on a Friday, made a sacrifice for us. We're kind of uniting our sacrifice and remembering his. Fifth, help give your time, gifts, and financial support to the church. So lastly, I'm going to talk, the books talk about canonized saints. So those are the people recognized by the church who have lived lives of heroic virtue. So there's canonized saints from all forms of life who practice our faith and, did, and lived out God's call. In order to be a canonized saint, usually they don't start the process until 50 years after someone's death. I always thought it's, you're better off just not making a statue for somebody until 50 years after they're dead. <laughs> Wind up finding out, find a tweet from 25 years, going to rip the statue down. Okay, just kidding around a little bit on that. But anyway, uh, canonized saints, there's a whole process for that. I won't go into the whole thing, but part of it is if someone's recognized as living a life, life of heroic virtue, someone within that diocese will write up their biography and include all of their works and writings. And then that is reviewed by a committee in Rome. And I'll say here and they to go ahead of the process. Then if it said yes, then they'd be called a venerable so-and-so, like venerable full machine. And if there is one miracle through their intercession, then they have the beatification. That may become blessed, Kateri Kakawitha would be another example. So like these miracles, like they really are strict with those. Like it has to be like a true miracle that cannot be scientifically explained, investigated by doctors and scientists. So like one example is uh, a friend of mine that was in the seminary, he's a little bit younger than me, actually quite a bit, but a um, he's staying at the church one summer. So he was at St. Anne's, Father Matt Marshall. When he was in the seminary, he's not really an exercise guy, but he was like sitting on, me, on, our, on a uh, stationary bike reading a book for class. And, and knowing him, he's probably going like as slow as he possibly can while keeping the pedals going. So he falls off the bike. His heart had completely stopped. And uh, so like, they happen to be a doctor from Cuba studying in the seminary. So this doctor grabs the defibrillator, defibrillates him, doesn't start the heart up. His heart was stopped, and then he gets to the hospital, and then he was brain dead for a couple days, but his, they got his heart going. He usually wants to go brain dead to Don. And uh, so he started praying, and, that, and he miraculously pretty much came back to life on the God day we read the gospel uh, where Jesus raised Lazarus. I kind of talked about it in my homily in Plover. I was like, you know, if Jesus can raise Lazarus, I'm sure his mother is thinking, why can't he raise up my son here? And uh, so after, it was a Sunday night, he came back to life and then uh, he had to almost relearn everything. He was kind of uh, in a tough spot, but he wound up getting ordained a priest and they attribute that miracle to an uh, African-American priest in uh, Chicago. Uh, uh, I usually remember his name, but I forgot it right now. I wrote a little biography on him. Because um, they had a mass at, right around the time, or at the time he came back, they had a mass and they prayed to that, or asked that priest to pray for Matt. Um, so then that miracle goes to Rome. So if that guy gets beatified, then I'm sure Matt will be invited to go 
for that. So you read about these, like if you look in the right spot, you can read about them all the time. A lot of times it could be like incurable cancer. So it's usually some kind of incurable thing that uh, is healed. So that's a little bit of detail on that. So then you have beatification mass and you have to have one more miracle like that to be a canonized uh, saint. So we don't pray to saints, we ask them to pray for us. Lastly, they talk about the Blessed Virgin Mary and as a model of holiness. So she said yes to God's plan in her life that's known as the fiat and uh, fiat meaning yes at the Annunciation. So uh, it's kind of a good example for us to say yes to God in our lives as well. And then she would, the Immaculate Conception means that she was born free from original sin. So Jesus wanted a holy vessel uh, for him to uh, take flesh from. At her death, she was assumed into heaven, meaning she has drawn body and soul into heaven. So the Assumption, we also celebrate a special uh, mass every year for that. So that's kind of, read about the Assumption in the early church fathers, same with the Immaculate Conception. So anyway, that's all I want to talk about today. And uh, any questions all about anything? Okay. My favorite is when you answer questions with the kids and they start answer, asking uh, 